Hello and good morning, everyone. We're here to talk about mental health here on the Gaia stage this morning. I hope you're all ready. I want to start us off with a little question. When you think of the word mental health, what's the first thing that comes into your head? If you're like many people, words that come to mind might be depression, anxiety. Maybe you think of mental illnesses, something like schizophrenia. But generally speaking, many people will think of words that have to do with struggle, tension, stress, difficulty, and challenge. And I find that really fascinating, that when we talk about mental health, what often comes to mind and often what we speak about is more along the lines of what happens when we are in a lack of mental health, when we are mentally potentially not well. We often speak in the negative instead of in the positive. And so in today's session, we're going to be very lucky because we're going to change that around. We're going to frame things in the positive. And today's speakers are really going to change a lot of that stigma that we might have around mental health and wellness and well-being. They're here to break patterns and help change the way that we talk about this often stigmatized, often prejudged topic that actually plays a part in every single one of our lives in some way, shape, or form. They are here to normalize talking about mental health, and it's going to start here today on today's stage. My name is Martina Bucal. I am a leadership development specialist. I'm a coach. I'm a speaker. And as a consultant working in this space, I often encounter questions around mental health, balance, well-being. And so I know how difficult it is to actually speak about this very complex subject, unpack it, and make it accessible so that we can all have conversations about it from a place of not feeling tense about it, but actually feeling open and like we can talk about mental health and wellness like it's any other part of our lives. And so, I'm here to host you today for this conversation, but our speakers are the ones that are really going to crack this conversation open, educate us, teach us, and really bring this new topic, this wonderful topic that needs to be spoken about on a global stage here to change now. We're going to start with a wonderful keynote from a wonderful lady uh, named Dr. Jennifer Wilde. She is going to be coming up here and sharing with us a little bit about resilience and what it means to be mentally strong and extraordinary. So brief introduction of Dr. Wilde. Dr. Jennifer Wilde is a psychological scientist at the University of Oxford. She's an international expert on how to build resilience to stress and trauma. She's an author of Be Extraordinary, Seven Key Skills to Transform Your Life from Ordinary to Extraordinary and has published extensively and received numerous awards for her work. The documentary Vertigo Road Trip, in which she treats people to overcome anxiety and lead extraordinary lives, aired on BBC One, attracting 2.2 million viewers. Dr. Wilde regularly appears on BBC, Sky, and CNN. Clearly, she's a woman who is dedicated to growing our awareness and engagement with this very important subject, Without further ado, I would love to welcome Dr. Jennifer Wilde to the Change Now stage. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Um, I have some slides um, that I'm going to take us through. Um, so if the tech team could ready the slides, that would be fantastic. Great, thank you. It's true, I am a trauma expert. But what does trauma have to teach us about being bold, about overcoming anxiety, about overcoming stress, about achieving extraordinary success? 
As a psychologist, I help people to overcome the crippling stress reaction, post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a problem that affects soldiers and survivors of other traumatic events, like survivors of mining disasters or car crashes or the sudden deaths of loved ones. As a scientist, I develop and test strategies to prevent post-traumatic stress disorder. So I've built programs based on the latest science to prevent PTSD for people working in the most dangerous jobs as police officers, firefighters, search and rescue personnel, paramedics, and more recently, our frontline healthcare workers. In my 20 years of practice, I have noticed something remarkable. Overcoming adversity and becoming extraordinary tap the same processes. People who flourish with or without trauma as their catalyst for change naturally draw on seven key skills. So in the next 18 minutes or so, I'm going to give you a glimpse of what they are, why they work, and how to get them so that you can become more bold and more extraordinary. So, the first key skill is extraordinary thinking. Extraordinary thinking is about how to move forward, not why the past happened in the way we feel it did. Extraordinary thinking nips dwelling in the bud, because dwelling takes us round and rounds and circles and makes us feel rubbish and leads to no plan or action. So imagine this. Imagine you have a really important, and you're very excited about a job interview that's happening Monday morning at 9 a.m., and you jump in your electric car and push the button, and the car doesn't start. So you push it again, and it still doesn't start. And you take a step back, and you think, why is this happening? Why is this happening today of all days? Why do bad things always happen to me? Now, imagine how you might be feeling. Now, I want you to imagine that scenario again, and this time when you jump in your electric vehicle and you push the button and it doesn't start, you think, now, how can I deal with this? How can I get to my job interview for 9 a.m.? In the first scenario, with why thoughts swelling your mind, you'll be much more likely to run home and pull the duvet over your head. But in the second scenario, how thoughts guide decision-making and problem-solving, you'll be much more likely to hop on public transport or get on your bicycle and cycle to the job interview, and you'll be much more likely to get there on time. Dwelling is an unproductive pattern of thinking. So the more we do it, the more we strengthen the neural pathways in our brain, making it the default mode of thinking when we encounter disappointment or stress. So extraordinary thinking is about turning why to how. Why becomes your cue to think, how can I move forwards? The second key skill is the unwavering capacity to create a fluid memory. To lead an extraordinary future, we must master our memories. This means creating fluid memories, so we're not interrupted throughout the day by intrusive memories. And it means learning to unhook the present from the past. People who lead extraordinary lives clean up their memories. They scoop up their difficult times, they dust off the dirt, and they change their painful meanings. No matter what they live through, they create a meaningful relationship to their past. They do this by rewriting their memories, not by changing the facts of what happened, but by changing the meaning of their challenging times. Rewriting our memories is a process called updating, and it's what the brain naturally does when we remember an event. We re-record it when we recall it. We need to change the worst meanings of our unhelpful memories. So take Joshua. Joshua is an American soldier. I first heard him speak several years ago on the radio, and he had been on a humanitarian aid mission in Iraq with his best friend, Staff Sergeant Marlon Harper. He was caught in a sniper attack, and the bullet instantly killed his friend and landed in Joshua's right leg, and he, it hit his femoral artery, 
and he died for 15 minutes. And the brigade surgeon was about to give up when he suddenly heard a faint pulse. And so he kept going, but he knew that Joshua would be very severely brain damaged because he had been medically dead for more than 15 minutes. But the miracle is, Joshua wasn't. He recovered, and he uh, fully recovered. He had post-traumatic stress disorder. He recovered from that. He campaigned across the USA, and he worked with the media, and he appealed to the US Congress to raise funds to support the emotional recovery of, from combat for soldiers. He's now a major contributor to the Wounded Warrior Project. So I interviewed Joshua for Be Extraordinary as a case study, and I discovered that he updated his memory of himself. He had, his original memory was being of a fit soldier on duty, very capable. He was then killed and weakened, and he then recovered with a wealth of knowledge to support other soldiers, the emotional recovery from what they've been through. He went back to Iraq to work with 130 soldiers in his platoon, welcoming emotional resilience into the unit. It's really unheard of in the military. So he updated his memory of himself. So updating works for all memories, not just troublesome memories, whether it's a, a memory of a trauma or a memory of a pitch that flopped, updating works with our worst meanings of those memories. So if we look at an everyday example, because of course we, we don't always want to focus on trauma and not all of us experience trauma, we do experience other memories, memories of self-doubt. Let's look at an example, say Tom. Tom is a 24-year-old software engineer. He applied for a promotion, uh, blanked in his interview, and he wasn't promoted. So to update his memory of that job interview that didn't go so well, he first had to spot the worst meaning of the memory. What did it say about Tom? What was the worst thing about blanking in his um, interview and not getting promoted? And he came up with the worst thing about forgetting what I wanted to say in this job interview is that it means I'm incapable, I'm incompetent, and I'll never succeed. So to update this memory, he then had to shift his focus to his achievements, and he had to work out the best meaning of his achievements. So he'd been to a decent university, had a degree, and he developed this really unique code that was being used in his company. So thinking about his achievements, he came up with a different meaning about what they say about himself as a person. And he came up with, I'm a hardworking person. I'm a kind person with grit. And what this really means is that I can achieve whatever I put my mind to. And with the lens of his best belief, he went and updated his worst memory, or his memory of self-doubt. So he transformed that memory. So instead of it being a memory of, I stuffed the job interview and I'm incapable, it became, he looked at the memory through the lens of his best belief, it became, I applied for a promotion, I had an excellent CV, I had a fabulous cover letter, and I had my interview, I wasn't hired for the new job, but I learned that I have key skills in problem solving. And I also learned really important questions that will help me to prepare for future interviews. I've applied for another two jobs. I've been shortlisted. And what this really says is it gives me more ev evidence that I'm competent and capable. So we need to update the worst meetings of our memories, memories of self-doubt. And really, really importantly, we need to break the, the link between the present and the past, between what's going on today and those past memories. So then versus now is a trauma treatment tool, and it helps people to unhook the present from the past by guiding people to focus on what's different today. What's different today in the here and now compared to the past event? So applying this to our lives today, if we think about then versus now, it's usually used with soldiers with post-traumatic stress or people who, other people have developed PTSD, but we can apply it to our lives. If we've had a situation that we weren't happy with, maybe we spoke up in a meeting and we had a really flat response, next time we go into a meeting, rather than focusing on how the two situations might be similar, the meeting of the past and the meeting today, we need to focus on what's different. Are there different people in the room? What's going on now that's different to the past? Maybe my slides are different. We really need to focus on the differences between then and now, and that helps to break that link between the present and the past. 
And keeping our attention rooted in the present is where it needs to be to progress our path to success. The next key and crucial skill is focus. It absolutely matters what you focus on and how you focus. People who transition from ordinary to extraordinary focus on what they can do, not on what they can't. They realize they don't have endless years to will their dreams into reality, so they learn to optimize their time without distraction. There are two types of focus. There's helpful focus, and there's unhelpful focus. Unhelpful attention is the kind of focus that's gone into my body, my thoughts, my feelings, my fears, and sensations. I suddenly become aware of what's going on inside myself. And I want to give you an example of unhelpful attention. It involves some water. So, if I have unhelpful attention, and say I'm really worried about um, sweating, let's say I'm worried about sweating, so I'll just make some fake sweat patches here. So, it, if I'm really worried about sweating, and I have unhelpful attention, my attention's going to come into my body, and I'm going to be focused on these uncomfortable water patches. And I'm going to be really, really aware of them, which is going to make me want to cover them up. And um, I'm probably going to feel embarrassed, and I'm not going to make a lot of eye contact with you. I'm going to become really distracted, and I'm going to lose my train of thought. And you're going to stare at the part of my body that I don't want you to be looking at. Whereas if I have sweat patches, and I have helpful attention, it's the kind of attention that's out of my head, I just put my attention on you and the talk, and I'm much more able to have a conversation with you without losing my train of thought. So it's really, really important to get our attention out of our head and to be much less aware of what's going on inside our bodies and our fears and our sensations. So helpful attention is the kind of attention that's out of our head and in the world. And moving on to the next skill, this is a really, really simple skill, but it's very, very effective. And this skill is called planning ahead. And it involves making a plan in the evening for the next day and including an enjoyable activity in that plan. It sounds almost too good to be true. There's a lot of science to support this skill that's come out of our lab in Oxford. And uh, making a plan in the evening, including a brief enjoyable activity in that plan for the next day, dramatically improves well-being. So use your plan, create a plan for the next day, and assign your tasks in half-hour chunks, and use the plan as a guide, as a schedule, to guide you throughout your day rewriting it and revamping it as you discover that you've wildly underestimated how long it takes to reply to those emails or write up that code or finish up that project. Planning ahead works because it moves routine decision-making to the night before, which frees up mental energy for you to devote to challenging tasks the next day. It makes you a better problem solver the next day because you've dealt with all of the routine decision-making the night before. And including a fun activity in your plan, however brief, means you're more likely to do something fun, which improves your well-being. So definitely, definitely plan ahead. And once you have your plan, the question is, how do you get started? So I suggest that you use the three-minute carrot. Avoidance keeps anxiety going. It keeps anxiety, stress, and fear going. There is no other outcome with avoidance. People who lead an extraordinary life kick avoidance. So if you're struggling to get started with something new, give yourself permission to use the three-minute carrot. And what this means is that you give yourself permission to try your new behavior for three minutes and then decide whether or not to carry on for another three minutes or to stop. Giving yourself a little nudge or permission to stop after three minutes is enough to get you started. Another way to get you over the start line is to break your first step into small, tiny steps and do the smallest, tiny step first. It's much easier, for example, to write the outline for your business plan rather than um, your entire background section. 
And so completing a small step is enough. And completing any step releases dopamine. It's a chemical pad on the back, and it will motivate next steps. So take a small step. That will get you started. And once you have taken that first step, use smart language. So what do I mean by smart language? Well, when we have a goal that we're working towards, we often come across temptations, and we often are at risk to giving in to temptations and not carrying on with our goal. So the idea of smart language is to use I don't versus I can't when faced with temptation. So when people use the words I don't, they're much less likely to give in to temptation. So for example, if you had planned on Tuesday night to work on a goal, maybe it is to write a business plan or to write an outline of a business plan, and your friend calls you up and says, oh, it's really sunny. Um, do you fancy coming down, coming out for a drink? Let's meet at the pub and have a drink. And if you say, I can't, I can't, I, I just can't, I, I've decided to work on this plan and I cannot come out and meet with you because I'll never finish this plan, you'll be much more likely to give in than if you use the words, I don't. So when your friend calls you and says, come on, it's beautiful weather, you must come out for a drink, come down to the pub, and you respond with, I don't drink on Tuesday, you'll be much more likely to carry on with your business plan. So the studies show that using the words I don't leads to greater empowerment with the goals. So remember I don't versus I can't when faced with temptation. And another tool to keep you going and to get you over that start line and to get you started is to make decisions based on how you want to feel in the future, not on how you're actually feeling. So to kick avoidance for good, we need to make decisions based on how we know we're going to feel, not on how we're actually feeling in the moment. Most people make decisions based on how they're feeling in the moment. And you may have experience of that when you've thought about going to the gym, for example. So if you know that going to the gym is going to make you feel upbeat and refreshed, make the decision to go knowing how it's going to make you feel. Or finishing up an admin task is going to make you feel rewarded and uplifted, make the decision to wrap up that task knowing how, you, how it's going to make you feel. And finally, the seventh key skill is the capacity to cultivate happiness. And this is perhaps the most important skill. Overcoming stress and overcoming anxiety or overcoming fear to lead an extraordinary life is truly a lifetime project. We don't want to wait to the end to enjoy it. So there are 11 tips in Be Extraordinary on how to raise your happiness set point. One of the most reliable ways to kickstart happy feelings is to discover or to create something new. It doesn't have to be solving the problem of cold fusion. It could be coming up with a new idea, solving a problem, or pursuing an artistic activity. People are happier when they're creative. And so when we're working intently on a task at hand and a problem arises and we use our resources, we create a solution. And research shows that people are most happy when they're doing something creative. And the things that people love most about chess or playing piano or rock climbing, for example, are the moments during those activities when they're discovering something new. They're being creative. You don't have to be an artist to be creative. Being creative is about expressing yourself in an original way, solving a problem, or pursuing something artistic. Research shows that when people are being creative, they feel happier, and those happy feelings extend to the following day. So get your creative juices flowing. You will feel happier as a result. So just to wrap up, every day we have the opportunity to make choices that will keep us stuck in stress or lead us in the direction of creating an extraordinary life. Why wait for tomorrow to lead an extraordinary life when you can create yours today? Tap extraordinary thinking. It is not overthinking. Dwelling is your cue to think, how can I move forwards? Create fluid memories. Update the worst meanings of any memories that hold you back. And break the link between the present and the past with then versus now. Focus. Use helpful attention 
to get your attention out of your head and into the world. And plan ahead. Break your day into half-hour chunks and include an enjoyable activity in your plan, however brief. And use the three-minute carrot to kick avoidance. And finally, discover or create something new. It could be trying a new exercise, solving a problem, or even trying a new recipe. The world benefits from extraordinary people. Be bold, be extraordinary. Thank you. Just a, a quick um, message to say that um, we're selling Be Extraordinary at the bookshop, and there'll be a book signing there at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for coming on stage and sharing with us how we can all be a little bit more resilient in our lives. I hope that you'll all take a moment to go check out the book, learn a little bit more from you. Maybe you're doing a book signing, yep. as far as I understand, so definitely worthwhile to go visit. I'm curious whether I should clean this <laughs> up before we move on, but it's okay. We, we, we flow with things as we go okay. here. So everyone, please give another round of applause, please, for Thank Dr. You. Jennifer Wild. Thank, Thank you. you so, so much. Thank you. I think we'll be okay. <laughs> so we're going to move into our next part of our session. So typically at Change Now, the, our format is that we do a keynote, then there's a nice panel discussion with a few experts sharing their solutions, and then after that, there's an intimate fireside chat. So we're going to move into the panel portion now of our day, and we're going to be bringing on stage two experts and then have a third expert joining us via Zoom from Ireland. Unfortunately, she could not get her visa to come visit us in person, but it will be just as amazing to have her here via Zoom. So I will introduce our panelists all at once. Then they will come and join us on stage just after. So our first panelist is Fanny Jacques. She is a practicing psychiatrist, as well as the co-founder of Mon Sherpa, the mental health director at Health Hero, and president of Mental Tech Alliance here in France. Our next panelist is Juanita Ray. She will be the one joining us through Zoom. Juanita is the founder and director of EduSoil, Design for Change South Africa, Sudan, and North Ireland. She is involved in nurturing child and adult well-being through community arts, youth leadership, and mental health programs in several countries, especially serving underserved populations. Her work also serves to destigmatize de childhood sexual abuse and trauma, and as well as domestic violence through the combined arts. Lastly, but definitely not least, we have Guillaume Dagvive. Guillaume is the co-founder and co-CEO of Mocha Care, based here in Paris. Based on his prior experience as a consultant at BCG and his mountain sports Mac practice, which I call monkey skills, <laughs> he's a very good climber from what I understand, he, is, he strongly believes that mental health is too often neglected by individuals and by companies, even though it is a tremendous source of performance. He founded Mocha Care more than two years ago, before the pandemic, and it's scaling fast by being exactly the right partner for companies with regards to mental health. He'll tell you more as he joins us on stage, along with the other panelists. Please welcome to the Change Now stage. Juanita joining us via Zoom here as well. Let's see if we can connect to her. And in the meantime, why don't I get us started? So we're here to talk about solutions, and we have Juanita. Beautiful. Hello. It's great to see your lovely face today. Everybody say hi to Juanita. <laughs> She's in Ireland. <laughs> So perfect, we've got all our panelists here. We're ready for a good discussion. Just so you know, if I'm looking in this direction, it's because we've got Juanita here, 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 and there. So your, your face is absolutely everywhere <laughs> right now, but we love it, it's good. <laughs> so we'll start off our discussion here, just hearing a little bit about your projects. Obviously, you're all in the mental health sphere. You're democratizing and also making it a lot more accessible and destigmatizing this whole concept of you know, mental health and what it means for all of us. I'd love to hear a little bit about each one of your projects and the problem that you're looking to solve here. I'm going to start with you, Fanny, if that's all right. 
Thanks. Um, so I am a psychiatrist, and uh, m maybe it, it seems a little bit weird, but uh, a few years ago I, I knew nothing about tech. I didn't mm. have a laptop, a computer, even a smartphone in uh, 2016, and uh, I had a private practice. Uh, but in my private practice, uh, Three, three thoughts. Uh, psychiatry w was uh, really uh, stigma uh, stigmatized. It, it, uh, it's still a taboo uh, subject for patients. They feel ashamed to, to see me. And uh, it, f psychiatry is not very fashionable because there is no innovation in it. So uh, uh, young medical students d don't choose uh, psychiatry. And um, second, second point, uh, the need is increasing. Uh, people are getting worse and worse, and uh, they are uh, less and less uh, well treated uh, because of um, uh, lack of uh, lack of means. And third, even if I, uh, if an, even I, when I see a patient in co in consultation between two appointments, uh, there is uh, maybe three weeks, and uh, during these uh, three weeks, uh, he can feel alone. Uh, uh, he can need uh, he, he needs tips, uh, uh, advices, and I am not here for him. Maybe he can relapse, and I am not here for him. So I decided to to uh, to create a mental health digital. Uh, Company, so uh, uh, first I needed to uh, to buy a, a smartphone <laughs> and the computer and uh, to learn uh, more about that. So uh, I founded two things: uh, a teleconsultation uh, company uh, to have an access to a, psych a psychiatrist in about uh, 24 hours. And the second thing was uh, Mon Sherpa, is a chatbot. It offers uh, to the user, it's free of course, and it offers to the user about uh, 200 uh, uh, therapy uh, exercises. My purpose is to um, democratize uh, psychiatry, mental health, destigmatize, and uh, not to feel shame to uh, see a psychiatrist and to make it accessible to uh, everybody, anywhere, anytime, and for all of diseases. Fantastic. I'm, yes. <laughs> I, I think it's wonderful to hear that there's something out there that's really helping people feel a lot closer to, you know, starting that mental health journey of healing, being closer to getting the help that they need when they need it. And that, that just, that fills my heart. Um, I think it's, it's really good to hear that somebody like you is out there. Thank you. And what about you, Guillaume? Tell us, Mocha. Yeah, so hello everyone. Um, so I'm the co-founder of Mocha.care. So it's quite the opposite from Fanny. I mean, uh, I know the tech for some time now, but uh, I do not know mental health uh, for so long because uh, I do not have any uh, psychological or coaching academic background. Uh, I just graduated from a business school. And for me, mental health was quite a discovery when I understood how important it was uh, in your day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to launch uh, Mocha.care, which is a company which aims at uh, changing the way we look at mental health by pushing a much more preventing and pro proactive approach. And so in a nutshell, what we do is to, we help companies support uh, the mental well-being of their teams uh, by providing access to coaches, therapists, psychologists. And the idea is that it will be financed and paid by a company but your company will never know whether you have been or not to a mocha practitioner. So, you know, you're confident and you're okay and willing to do it. Uh, and we also, you know, uh, put a lot of attention on how to help companies avoid uh, toxic management, uh, bringing, you know, uh, trainings on uh, how could I deal with my stress and not pass it, pass it on my teams and so on and so on. Beautiful. And you were telling me uh, before we actually came on stage, we had a little bit of a conversation about, you know, the company that you've started. And you were telling me that actually you had uh, sort of a first, uh, first-hand experience within your team, right? That in the workplace, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you tell, tell us what, uh, what happened essentially that made you sort of come up with this idea. Um, yes, indeed. Um, you know, at the very beginning myself, I was a bit skeptical about mm -hmm. psychology. I, I was this kind of person thinking like, okay, uh, I don't really understand the point of it, or maybe I do not feel concerned about it. And then myself, I was in a very under-pressure environment. 
and I've been quite close from going through a burnout. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I took a step back and I was, okay, so uh, I could do one. So just, you know, be very humble about that. And at that time, in my office, we were six people. Three people have been through a burnout or a depression. So it was a bit uh, of a slap in my face. Mm. Like, wow, uh, this is just absurd. And what I understood is how, you know, powerless our companies in face of these topics and the importance of raising awareness mm. about mental health and you know it's just okay not to be okay and when you look at the documentary from Michael Phelps which is named uh, The Weight of Gold and you see that even top Olympics athletes have struggled and challenges with, with mental health you say okay so it's we are all concerned and talking about your mental health is just as normal as talking about your physical health, nothing more. Yeah, yeah. I think what's, what's really good to hear as well is, you know, that there are several perspectives on mental health. On the one hand, there can be a stigma about, you know, dealing with it on our own, but sometimes it can be really difficult to actually be around other people who have their own mental health struggles and trying to sort of grapple with, okay, how do I show up for these people who I often care about or work with? How do I, you know, how do I receive them well? How do I actually become a space for that conversation? So it, there's sort of those two perspectives, I think, there that are really important. How do I deal with it myself? What can I do? What can I, how can I get help? And also, how can I be there for others? Juanita is going to be our next panelist who is going to tell us a little bit about her project, what she's doing in the world in the space of mental health as well. Juanita, can you tell us a little bit about your projects and the problems that you're looking to solve, please? Hello. Um, so I work on three projects that interweave to destigmatize trauma and enable mental health access for the underserved. It took me 34 years to say the word rape out loud. And while culture shamed me into silence, writing, drawing, meditating, singing, design thinking, therapy has helped me to accept my scars and not need to hide them. My artwork this destigmatizes childhood sexual trauma and mental disorders through a range of media. With my international teaching experience and background, I set up EduSoil, an international nonprofit arts organization that enables access to mental health support for underserved children and adults through community arts, well being, and youth leadership opportunities. And building on that, Mita Mandala is our tech for good startup through which we are digitizing in-person and print prototypes we tested with 15,000 primarily Black and Asian people in 11 countries um, since 2011. We're currently building and prototyping a data-driven, culturally responsive and gamified well-being management platform, for which you can sign up to be to test on our website. Wonderful. Thank you, Juanita, for sharing a little bit about what you're up to. I, I think it's amazing that we have such a diverse group of voices here. We have someone who's working right in psychiatry, right there in the tech space, which you were absolutely not expecting in the least from what I understood. When we first spoke, Fanny, you told me you had a piece of paper and a pen, and that's basically how you ran your psychiatry practice, <laughs> to now running a tech platform, essentially. Then we've got, you know, a wonderful perspective on workplace stress and how can we actually help empower people in the workplace. And then we've got a much more beautifully sort of creative uh, space that Juanita is in dealing with, you know, helping normalize um, and talk about, you know, stress, trauma, childhood sexual abuse, and all of these things. I think it's a great bit of breadth here that, uh, that our speakers bring to the stage. I'm curious, you know, from all three of your different perspectives, what is your ultimate sort of vision? What would you love to see, the, the big movement here, um, you know, to help things move towards that democratization, the destigmatization de that we're talking about here? Like, what's, what's the ultimate goal? If you could think of, you know, the, the one perfect thing that we could just wish for and it would happen. What are your, what are your thoughts, Fanny? Would you like to? Um, 
for me, I, I think there is only one rule. You have to speak up. Mm. Uh, you said it, it's okay not to be okay. Yeah. And uh, maybe uh, we have to begin that uh, with our kids. We have to learn them uh, to talk about their feelings, about their emotion, that uh, if uh, they feel uh, stressed, uh, disappointed, uh, sad, worried, they have to share it with us. There is no shame uh, to, to, to talk about our feelings. And uh, if it's getting worse, of course, we have to see a specialist. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, while we see a coach uh, for uh, physical health, uh, we can see, of course, a psychiatrist or a psychologist uh, for mental health. It's not a shame, it's normal. And uh, so you, you, we have to talk about them. According to the WHO, uh, mental health is not only psychiatry, it's a, it's a global state of well being. So it's very important. It, it goes far beyond psychiatry and mental health disease. It uh, allows person to face difficulties and uh, to, uh, to realize uh, his, uh, his entire potential. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. What about you? Oh, yeah. actually, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, um, Yeah, I, I do like your vision, uh, Fanny, and uh, I, I think I share, share it quite a lot uh, because my ultimate goal or vision would be we want a society in which uh, um, you know, going to a psychologist is just as easy as having a coffee. Mm. And in fact, uh, that's why we have called uh, our company Mocha, uh, because we want you know, to, to destigmatize mental health and make it much more accessible. Like, we, we want people you know, to say as easily, like, uh, I'm having some mental health challenges, as easy as saying, like, my, my, uh, my back hurts. You know, mm. it's exactly the same, physical yeah. and mental health. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so it's make it easier to talk about. Easier to talk about, and then I think we will be it will be much easier to understand uh, the definition from uh, WHO of mental health, which is, as you said, uh, a state of mental well-being, not uh, an addition of uh, mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Juanita, what about you? What, what would your yeah. wish be? Mm. So it's peace, personal, global, universal peace. So for me, I, I dream of teachers and learners taking 10 minutes of me time each day to do all the things that uh, has been mentioned, you know, saying when they're not feeling confident or even interested in a lesson, <laughs> because that's okay too. And um, this peace begins with us. And the only way to create this mentally healthy, thr thriving world is by taking the time to breathe into these challenges. And so you know, everybody who's spoken already has talked about all of these very simple strategies. And I, I think having time each day, especially in classrooms, <sighs> would change things. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. The vision of peace. And I think when I spoke to you before as well, Juanita, you're mentioning that peace is, you know, it's, it's complex. It's not just, uh, you know, peace. When we think of peace, sometimes it can mean world peace. We think about peace among people, but there's also such a thing as inner peace, which is something else entirely. Um, and you shared with me an exercise that I think is really powerful that I'd love for you to take our audience through today, if you'd be willing, that helps access that, that point, that helps us build that, that inner peace, that, um, that place within us. Would you lead us through that? Sure. So this is an invitation. Um, and the invitation that I extend uh, to anyone here is one that I extend to myself, <laughs> and that is to take a few moments um, just to, to notice where uh, my body is. And you could do that right now, you know, noticing where your feet are, where your body is against the chair, getting a sense of being supported, being held in this physical space. And, and if it feels comfortable, perhaps bringing the hands, your hands, onto your chest, your belly, your legs, just, just somewhere that's a little check-in to pay a bit more attention to your body. 
And if it feels comfortable to lower the gaze, to close the eyes, it doesn't matter. It's just this little step towards myself. And while here, we might encounter an awareness of the breath. And it's, it's not even like changing the breath in any way. It's just encountering this breath that's happening whether we're thinking about it or not. And maybe, just here, maybe a little thank you. Thank you to this body. Thank you to this breath. You might notice that the breath might have changed in some way, and that's all right. And thoughts might have come and gone, and that's okay too. And this last bit as we come back would be to lean into this breath, maybe breathe a little deeper in and longer out. And if the eyes have been closed and opening them, or if the gaze has been lowered, then raising the eyes and meeting the world, <laughs> the room. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much for that, Juanita. It's a, I feel like it's such a pleasure to be able to hear that, you know, there are so many different approaches and different ways that we can meet our mental health. We can meet them in a very breath-oriented way where we're touching base with ourselves and just seeing what's happening within us. And that's, that's already a really strong starting point is just being in a state of self-awareness and recognizing Ooh, what is going on with me today? What's the weather forecast is what I call it, right? You know, what's, what's happening here today? So coming at it from a very personal perspective, then, you know, we can meet someone external to us who can help us guide us through our journey with their expertise to say, ask us the right questions, to help us find those answers within ourselves. Because some of us, maybe, we can sit with ourselves and we can easily access those things. Some of us might need more guidance, and both of those things are absolutely okay. In fact, you know, having help along the way is fantastic. And sometimes even sharing in that journey can make it that much more powerful. And we can be meeting our mental health challenges in so many different ways, and our mental health opportunities in different ways. In some ways, work can be a place that inspires us, that drives our performance. We want to do fantastic things. And at the same time, it can be the very place that we meet our biggest stressors, the place where because we're so motivated and so challenged and so connected to other people, we can get overstimulated. We can have a really stressful time. And so it is really important that we recognize that you know, this sphere of mental health, it's everywhere. You know, it's in, we're, we're always in this space of fluctuating within ourselves. People around us are fluctuating in terms of what's going on for them. And so in a big way for me, what this panel has, has shown me is that actually what, what I feel we, we all could use is just a heightened level of awareness about we're all different. We all have our own internal world that's doing all kinds of things at any given time. And if we are aware enough, if we take that time to just check in on our mental health, actually, that can really bring out the best in all of us. We can be the people that we want to be in the way that we want. We can live the lives that we want to live, ultimately be the people we want to be at work. And I think that, that that's an incredible call to action. If we can just be present with that and be open to the fact that others are experiencing those things, that's already a massive, massive change and step forward, I think. Beautiful. I want to thank all of our panelists here today for sharing your stories. Thank you. Your initiatives. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're very, very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on this stage. I am going to escort you off as we go over into our next session, which is a fireside chat. But I want to give you a big, big thank you and ideally a hug as we head out of here. <laughs> Everyone give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Uh, go down this way. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. So we are next going to be moving into our fireside chat. I'm just looking for a quick cue from my stage team just to confirm that we've got everything set up in the way that we need to right now. All good. 
Perfect. So we are going to scooch on into the Fireside uh, uh, chat session now. We are very lucky that we are going to have some extra time here with Juanita, who I introduced in our last session. So Juanita, you're still with us on our big screen and then my two little screens here. And what I really want to dive into, so fireside chats, if the, for those of you who are maybe not familiar, are a little bit more of an intimate discussion. So panels are, you know, we're talking about those initiatives, getting things done, we're being kind of proactive and informational, informative. What we're here to talk about now with Juanita is a little bit, is a little bit deeper. We want to talk about something that I know is close to her heart, to share her story. And I'm not sure which way I'm supposed to meet her right now, so I'm just going to pick this one here, Juanita. <laughs> and what I really want to share with the audience and what I want you to share with the audience today is a little bit about your story with mental health and how actually you came into this space. Because I know that for you for many years now, this is this space has been, you know, your home. This has been where you've built a lot of your work. Um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of why this matters so much and actually how you got to that place where it did matter so much that you came to these solutions? Hmm. Well, I'm going to start with, I first started meditating when I was probably around five years old. There was no cushion. <laughs> it was uh, in a temple in, in Durban, South Africa. And um, I think things that I was becoming aware of in my mind, um, memories, which were starting to, to filter up, um, were, were becoming present because of this, this awareness, right? Um, and, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because you, you, you mentioned the word home, the, the, this mental health work being my home, and it always has been. The difficulty for me was that uh, I found it almost uh, impossible to be at home in my body mm. because of um, an experience of childhood rape at a very young age. And while it was n necessary uh, for me to uh, be present with the children that I was teaching because I became a school teacher and I've had the absolute extraordinary blessing of being w w able to work with the wonderful Kiran Brissethi through Design for Change and working with others, empowering others to, especially children to create change in their lives. I reached a point um, a few years ago where of becoming really ill, becoming really sick, and realizing that although I was doing meaningful work and helping others through EduSoy, through our nonprofit arts organization, um, through Design for Change, all the artwork that I had been creating over the years that was really just feelings that I didn't want to look at. Um, I needed to hold close because it was, it's always been a part of me. And that four-year-old child that I was afraid had done something wrong. And I was, you know, I believed ha was responsible for things she was never responsible for. It was only until I accepted that the only person who was going to hold her in the way she needed was me, that I feel like I've, Truly come home to doing this work. Yeah. I, I I love the way that that you put that, and I feel like what I hear maybe as a subtext in there a little bit too. You know, you said there are certain feelings that you didn't want to sort of at the beginning sort of face, or um, I, you know, I'm paraphrasing. I feel like for many people, that's actually the starting point and why we don't talk about mental health because it is scary, intimidating. These feelings are often big, you know. Uh, shame can come up, fear in a major way, worry, anxiety, you know, whatever it is that we're, we could be feeling that's already difficult can be exacerbated by the fear we have of touching it more closely, right? It's one thing to bury that feeling and say, no, 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 I'm not gonna deal with this right now and put it in a nice little box and tuck it away. It's a completely different thing to open that box and say, hey, we're here to talk. And by the way, I might be sharing this story with other people or asking for help. That can feel really vulnerable, I believe. How do you approach that 
Or how have you seen people approach that in your work? How do we basically cross that bridge of fear that can come with dealing with our own inner world, especially when it feels scary? Um, so it, building on that analogy of the box, you know, one of the expressions I have used, um, because it's felt like this physically for me, is that I've opened up the, the coffin in which my four-year-old child was buried alive. Oh. And it was only when I did that, that uh, the work that I've been doing through EduSoil, our nonprofit arts organization, the work that we're starting to do with Meet and Mandala, our digital platform that we're building, actually um, has come to life in a different way because for all of this time that I've been present with, with others, to a point, to a point, um, I wasn't totally present with myself. Mm. And so by, um, I guess, being uh, willing, being um, prepared or being uh, afraid, afraid and um, okay about being afraid, mm. uh, being vulnerable. Um, with myself um, is the only way that I feel I can fully support anybody else. And uh, to be honest, for, for quite a, a while, I, I took a step back from facilitating mindfulness and yoga and a, a bunch of programs because I questioned, you know, am I, what are my intentions? Am I really the right person to do this? For, for all those years that I wasn't 100% present and and then I came to realize that you know all of that is valid all of that is necessary because that's where we all are we are all stumbling and we're all making mistakes and by sharing that with each other by sharing the difficulties we normalize the struggle and through that we get support yeah yeah I, I think what um what I, what I really love about what you said is I, there's something about perfectionism in there, isn't there? About how, as humans, I think sometimes we expect that we have to get it just right, or that we have to carry a certain face, or be brave, or have the courage, or what have you. Um, sometimes that's an expectation that we put on ourselves solely. It's not actually what the world expects of us. And in fact, when we get vulnerable, when we say, hey, I'm not okay, that can actually be a huge breakthrough moment and a moment where we actually give another person permission to be a little bit more vulnerable and a little bit more imperfect as well. It's like the standards are so, so high. And if we just treat each other like human beings, actually things get a lot better for everyone. Has that been your experience? Uh, I wrote, uh, I think it's a, it's a line in a song, but I'm not remembering, remembering perfectly right now, but it's um, nobody, even in my, you know, the community in which oh, there wasn't a space to, to say what had happened and neither was there support to, um, uh, sorry, what's the word, to report the crime and... Um, all of those things, all of those necessary things, which they're, they're outside, they're, they're external, and we, we tend to measure ourselves against what we, we see and what we are shown. Yet none of, none of that compared to anything I was saying to myself. Hmm. Because I was the worst judge. I was the harshest judge. And I think we, we need to um, be aware of the impact that is being, uh, of the messaging on children, particularly, particularly because, you know, um, when, we, when we start to make it okay to, to be, to say I'm stressed, to say I need a break, I, can I just put my pen down and, <laughs> and not write this, you know, or not answer this math problem right now? Um, we, we're, and as teachers, as adults, as parents, we say, that's okay. 
you know these are these are messages and what that those messages are meeting are the voices in our own heads hmm. so it's so important for us to to make uh, support visible and accessible and at the same time recognize that we are constantly judging and we are constantly so harsh and we're working through that like Jennifer said we're working through all of that and and it takes time so yeah yeah it takes time and i think that that's that's a really important part of all of this as well, right? Is mental health um, work or working with our mental health, self-understanding and all of that, it doesn't happen in just one moment in time. It's something that, you know, we can have a whole life journey around. Um, you know, without sharing too much about myself, I know that for me that has very much been the case, is, you know, one day I open that box and I, ever since, you know, <laughs> I'm touching base with what's inside there and seeing what I can heal and what I can grow and seeking out more and more environments where I can feel safe to, you know, unpack that box a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, what would you say, and this is gonna be my final question, what would you say to somebody who's sort of starting that journey? What's a, a word of inspiration, a word of advice for somebody who's maybe just at that starting point where that box is there in front of them and they're ready to look inside? Hmm. Wow. Um, there's so many things that come to mind, uh, and I guess, particularly with uh, with with trauma, um, or with without there being any specific one um, at all, we all walk around with so much uh, judgment uh, of ourselves and um and and the, the difficulties in the world uh, I mean, we're looking around today with all of the upheaval happening in the world i would say that being able to get to a point of just you know holding ourselves it's about us holding ourselves so taking that time to to hold whatever it is, because whether that is the um, <laughs> the perfectionist or whether that is the the judge or whether that is the person who is terrified or you know, blindly optimistic, all of it's welcome, and and we are the only ones who can hold ourselves, and so giving ourselves permission to to do that. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, Juanita. This has been a true, truly heart-touching conversation with you. I'm so, so grateful that you could join us for extra time today on our stage. It's just wonderful. I'm taking away from it that, you know, I really want to spend a little more time with myself and create that space for my friends as much as possible and my family whenever I can to make it okay to talk about these big subjects and be that, that holder for those people as well when they need me. As long as I'm taking care of myself, I took that away from what you said too. Take care of self so that you can take care of others. So thank you so, so much, Juanita. It was wonderful to have you on stage. Please everyone give Juanita a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. All right, everyone. That is all the time we have together today uh, on the topic of mental health, wellness, and resilience. I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, I know on my side, I've definitely learned a lot. I was taking feverish notes from Dr. Jennifer Weld at the beginning. I've enjoyed the heart-to-heart -heart discussions with Juanita and others, learning about the different ways that we can democratize access to mental health care. I hope you've also taken a lot of inspiration from this, and I challenge you all to make a change in your lives now that makes this topic just a little bit less stigmatized, a little bit more normal for all of us because we're all human at the end of the day and mental health is just one part of being human. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>